in just a second, mic you up and then turn on the speaker. Do the big introduction. this on and then we'll get started. I'm using that on one of those on my, uh, the book I'm writing. Yeah? Yeah, like this, it's great. Does it have the USB port built in that you just jam it yes. in? Yes. Mm -hmm. as well? Mm -hmm. I have found, by the way, a new system for me for doing transcriptions way faster. Mm -hmm. well, we'll talk about that. Hi, everybody. Thank Hi, you Harry. so much. Hi, Susan. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, as you all know, I'm Terry Stratton, Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild. It's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, the Dramatist Guild tonight and to this DG Academy seminar. We actually had Jeff come to our national conference last year in Fairfax, Virginia, and his seminar was one of the most popular. I've gotten emails from people asking for us to repeat it, so here we are. Hopefully a lot of them are also on live play TV and can be picking it up. Um, if you could please turn off your cell phones um, and your pagers and anything that will make noise. Again, we are audio recording, so if you ask a question at any time during the event, make sure you speak up so the people online can hear the question in case it's a question they want to know the answer to as well. And as always, if you have ideas for other seminars or events that you'd like to see here at the Guild, we're pretty full here for the fall, which is exciting, but I'm still looking for the spring. Send me all suggestions that you have, and I will appreciate it. So without further ado, I am very happy to introduce to you Drama Skill Council member, playwright, and all-around great guy, Jeffrey Sweet. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, all-around great guy, that's something to live up to. I was <laughs> hoping to misbehave. Well, anyway. Hello. Um, okay, uh, improvisation and playwriting. Uh, a number of years ago, um, when I was a kid, I noticed that a lot of the most interesting people working in theater and film at the time uh, came out of one place. They came out of a place called Second City, which was an improvisational theater in Chicago. And I wanted to read a book about this, and it turned out nobody had written the book, so with that uh, wonderful uh, step of logic uh, that, uh, that I, I, I ended up writing the book. Mm -hmm. So I went running around the country uh, interviewing people like uh, Mike Nichols and uh, Paul Sills and Barbara Harris and Alan Arkin and Joan Rivers and uh, um, had a swell time for a number of years. But I thought I was taking a vacation from playwriting because it seemed to me that uh, improvisational theater by very definition didn't have any use for, uh, for writers. It was material that uh, was developed on, uh, on the feet. You know, actors got up and uh, improvised uh, based on premises, and uh, um, the writer really didn't have much to do with this. And, of course, I was wrong. Otherwise, there'd be no point in holding this seminar. Um, at a certain point, I realized that what made a good scene uh, improvisationally also uh, uh, pertain to making a good scene that uh, was written. I mean, after all, we're facing the same uh, injunction from the audience, which is, you know, to create behavior that's interesting, that's compelling, stuff that the audience uh, can invest in, the stuff that the audience wants to see, to, uh, to watch characters pursuing objectives. So uh, I started... Uh, I started looking at, the, at improvisational theory and trying to see how it overlapped into, uh, over, uh, overlapped into playwriting theory. Did, uh, many of you know who Viola Spolin was. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see lots of uh, heads uh, nodding. Uh, I, are there any heads nodding? I uh, can't see. Anyway, uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Viola, who uh, uh, treated me miserably. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, w I was interviewing her, and she was she was she was alternately charming and telling me, "Oh, you're asking the wrong questions, darling." I mean, you just don't. But and then she would answer the questions, and I'd get the material that I wanted. But um, Viola pretty much codified did the pioneering work of uh, uh, codifying and essentially developing uh, uh, what are known now as theater games. I'll tell you where they came from. 
Um, she was hired in the 30s to uh, put together a children's theater for the WPA, and she didn't want to direct kids in an authoritarian way to say, okay, uh, when you say your line here, stand, uh, stand uh, over there on the third tile and look at the exit sign and belt it out loud so that uh, everybody can hear it. She thought that pushing kids around was uh, a, sort of uh, uh, abusive and, uh, and uh, intimidating. What she decided that she was trying to do was to get the kids to collaborate on creating moments for the uh, plays that they were rehearsing. So for instance, at one point she was working with um, uh, teenagers, a boy and a girl, who um, uh, were supposed to be doing uh, a, a sort of a romantic scene. And their body language was, well, pretty much my body language now, you know, just very constricted and very, you know, this and that. And she's, she, instead of saying, well, for God's sakes, you know, use your hands, which would have been a, a, a terrible thing to say, she said, all right, we're going to play a game. And she started making up a game on the spot. It's called contact. And the rule of contact is that for every, for every line that you have to say to the other person, you have to figure out an organic way to make physical contact with the other person. And the kid's point of concentration shifted from being, oh, God, I really would rather be outdoors playing, or why do I have to sit here and do this awful thing, to figuring out uh, how to satisfy the rules of the game cleverly. And that's where th what they did, was they kept figuring out new wa ways of making physical contact. And Viola would laugh with delight and say, oh, that's marvelous, that's wonderful, that has to be in the final show. And indeed, the final show was made up largely of moments that the kids had invented themselves uh, in response to the games. So she kept uh, coming up with, uh, she kept coming up with uh, these kinds of games. And she had a son. And her son uh, was raised watching how uh, his mom worked, and her son's name was Paul Sills. I don't know how many of you know the name uh, Paul Sills. Again, names here, uh, heads here are nodding. How are you doing? Um, and uh, Sills used uh, these improvisational theater techniques to um, uh, first uh, uh, work with a repertory company in Chicago that was called the Playwrights Theater Club, then to help found something called the Compass Players, which was the first real ongoing improvisational theater in America, which is where Nichols and May and Shelley Berman all came from. And then um, uh, he put together a more polished version of the Compass, and it was called Second City, which opened in 1959 and has been going uh, pretty constantly since. So um, I was interested in how these games related to, um, uh, to playwriting theory. And I was also interested in, uh, I, I also had a conversation with Sills which changed most of my ideas about the theater. You see, here's what I thought the theater was about, okay? I thought, you know, a person of talent, perhaps of genius, a writer, um, would write something. And uh, a person of enormous taste uh, with a, a fat pocket uh, a producer would recognize this. You know, would hire, uh, would, would, would take an option on the, on the play and hire uh, uh, directors and actors to realize the vision of the playwright. And I thought that was what the theater was about. And I sat down to talk to Paul Sills and rather quickly was uh, disabused of this uh, because he made me realize that there are only two absolutely essential elements to theater. Can anybody guess what those two essential elements are? That's one. Audience is one. So what, what does the audience have to have in front of it in order to uh, be happy and say, oh, hooray, there's a show on? Actors. Actors. That's all you need to have to have some kind of theater. I'm not saying it'll necessarily be great theater, but theater existed in the world way before there, was, uh, there were playwrights or before anybody was literate enough to uh, hammer words onto a, a page. So at that point, I realized, well, gee, if uh, all you need to have uh, some kind of theater actors and audience, then the playwright's job is an extension of the actor's function. If the actor m was making stuff up spontaneously, what a playwright did was plan ahead. And so playwriting is an extension of acting. Now, there are some people who would disagree with me um, on this. Uh, um, Edward Albee would disagree with me on this. Um, and I respect Edward Albee as I do few people, so I'm not going to fight with him. But I believe something different. Mm -hmm. I believe that the playwriting is an extension of the actor's function, and that the job of the playwright is to give opportunities for the actors to create compelling behavior. So now let's get back to, uh, let's get back to the idea of improvisational theory. Well, there are various different games that can be used to help uh, develop playwriting skills. I'm going to demonstrate one right now. I'm going to do a monologue. 
uh, a boy who's 10 or 11 years old, and he's talking to a friend of his. And um, he says to his friend, he says, so it's, uh, he's supposed to show up at 10 o'clock. It's what, 10, 15? You know? My mom says, hey, you know, he'll probably be here soon. He's probably just, you know, stuck in traffic. And I said, Mom, it's cool. It's all right. You know, he shows, he shows. If he doesn't show, I got homework to do. I can call Larry. I can play chess. And she says, you know, we're all adjusting. I said, Mom, I'm cool. I'm fine. I'm okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. So like 1020, you know, I'm up in my bedroom and I'm looking out the window. I look across the street and he pulls, his car pulls up. I see him get out of the car. He's walking up the walk to the front porch. My room's over the porch. I can, I can hear them talking. She says, you're late. He says, don't start. She says, I'm not starting. I'm just observing that, you know, you said you're going to be here at 10 o'clock. It is now, what, 1020? He says, I got delayed. I'm sure, she, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you got delayed. Well, you know, if you want to maintain a relationship and you go on like this for a while, and I call out and I say, hey, you know, you guys, I can hear you. And he says, well, if you can hear me, you know I'm here, right? Come on, sport, let's get going. Grab your jacket, let's go. So I, you know, I put on my jacket. I come downstairs. Mom kisses me on the cheek, you yeah. know. I, uh, I, I go across, you know, I get in the car. He says, I'm sorry I'm late. I said, fine, it's cool, it doesn't matter, you're here. He says, uh, I got the I said, fine, it doesn't matter, we're here. I, you know, we're going, well, so what are we going to do this week? What is it this week? We're going to go to a museum, we're going to play miniature golf, or hey, I know what would we'll be just loads of fun is, why don't we have lunch with your girlfriend? Can we just do this? Can we just go? Can we just do this? All right, so tell me, um, what's the story? What's going on? Sports father picking up child who does this every week. And so today is what day? Saturday. Yeah, or what, 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 what day would you technically call that? If, if, uh, Visit, oh, visitation. visitation day. Okay, let me point something out. By the way, terrific. Parents are divorced. The man is the father, I never said father, and today's visitation day. I didn't use any of those words. If I had used any of those words, what effectiveness th this little piece has would have gone out the window. Because what I did purposely was not to use any of those words that you would supply them. It meant that you had to be an active participant. You had to create the meaning of the scene. Those are the three most important words in the scene, and I didn't use them. We often have this idea that in order to get an idea across to the audience, we actually have to say certain things. And frequently, it is more effective not to say them, but to create the circumstances under which the audience supplies uh, this most important idea for themselves. You guys got it. You didn't have, you know, I didn't have to spoon feed you. I, I gave you very specific actions. And you said, OK, what matrix of meaning could encompass the, the, these phenomena? You know, who, who is the guy across the street? Who would talk to, 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 to uh, this boy's mother like that? You know, what, what would the circumstances be? And you filled that in. But I'm a great believer that that's one of the things that we're trying to do with an audience, is we're trying to create the circumstances under which they become so wrapped up in the immediate moment that they start filling in the important information. And that means that they're not passive. There is little more deadly in the theater than to invite an audience to be passive. If you create the circumstances under which the audience becomes an active part of the event, if they come up with the meaning of the scene for themselves, if they come up with and fill in the key details themselves, then they, they can't fall asleep. They, they're leaning forward. They're saying, oh, I have to put this together. And they do. It's a way of keeping people active. It's a way of, uh, of, of, of making certain that uh, uh, that they're part of the that they're part of the process. I'm going to make a few observations, and then I'm going to ask some people to uh, to try to try this. Um, one observation is um, I don't know if you noticed, but I never used the past tense. I kept it in the present tense. Why? I think the stage uh, flourishes in the present tense. I think we were watching to see what characters do, what choices they make now. As soon as you move to the past tense, uh, the energy leeches out of the scene. This is one of the reasons why novelists tend to write very bad plays, because they're mostly so used to writing in the past tense that when they start writing plays, that habit carries over. Take a look at uh, stuff written by, you know, like William Faulkner tried writing a novel. Big, long speeches in the past tense. Great, great writer, miserable playwright. 
and 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 that's one of the that's one of the reasons is that the past tense is deadly on the stage. It doesn't mean that you can't relate stuff from the past, but when you do relate something from the stat past, you use something called the historical present, which is something you use all the time. What is a historical present? You set up that the action that is being narrated happened in the past, but you relate it in the present tense. Sometimes you can do it with just one line. I was walking down the street the other day, and suddenly I see this guy. He must be six foot two, and he's got a scar on his face that looks like the map of Argentina. I know I've seen him someplace before, and as I look at him, he looks at me. Our eyes meet, and suddenly I realize, aha, America's most wanted. I start to run. He's running after me. I make turn the corner. I run into an alleyway, except it's not an alleyway. It's a dead end. And as I turn around, I see him approaching, and the shadow of the top of his head touches the tips of my shoes. Well, now, obviously, I lived and survived, you know, because I'm telling you the story. But you heard how, by going into the present tense, there's suddenly a sense of, 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 of danger. And it, instead of relating something from the past, I am narrating re-experiencing it which is something you probably notice that you do yourself when you're talking to friends about a particularly vivid uh, um, uh, incident in your lives. You may start in the past, but more often than not, you will find yourself slipping into the present tense because as you relive it, you narrate it. So the present tense is tremendously useful on stage. Past tense is, uh, uh, tends to uh, dampen the energy. So, okay, one th that was one thing. I used the present tense a lot. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, um, yes, I also used almost no, ad almost no adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives and adverbs are, uh, I think, uh, junk writing. Um, somebody once sent uh, Chekhov a novel for his evaluation, and Chekhov wrote back and said, uh, oh, this is, this is a very interesting novel, and think how much better it will be once you cut the adjectives. Why? Why am I so down on adjectives and adverbs? Because they are evaluative words, and the evaluation properly belongs to the audience. What's more interesting to say that Larry is cheap, stingy, or for me to say that Larry tipped 50 cents on the $30 check? If I say Larry tipped 30 cents, 50 cents on the $30 check, you come up with cheap, stingy, right? So the evaluation belongs to you. So I, I think that the evaluation belongs to the audience. So that's, uh, what else did I, was that, was that, oh well, okay, unspoken word, uh, keep it in the present tense and, uh, and uh, uh, avoid adjectives and adverbs. I think those are the three major points. All right, anyway, so the exercise is called the power of the unspoken word. And um, this is how it goes is uh, I'm, I'm going to ask for people to, uh, to try improvising short monologues, uh, keeping it to the present tense, avoiding, uh, avoiding uh, adjectives. Think of a noun and try to, um, try to invoke the noun in our, in our minds without using the noun. OK, does this make sense? I'll give you an example. No, it's, uh, the, the, the workmanship is just wonderful. The mahogany, the brass, uh, the, the, the lining is, is just a, a extraordinary. I'm, uh, but I swear to you, if I buried my father in this, he would <laughs> rise out of the grave and grab me by the throat and say, you spent how much? Yeah. So you see? The, what happens is, I don't know how many of you had logic in, in high school or college. Uh, if you know about what a, a syllogism is, syllogism is uh, a, 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 a three-sentence uh, um, uh, logical device. So the first two sentences are premises, and the third sentence is the, is the conclusion. All Martians love Ravel. Okay, Reginald is a Martian. Therefore, Reginald loves Ravel. Okay, what I'm suggesting is that we put the premises on the stage and we leave the conclusions to the audience. And this exercise is designed to do just that. Put the premises on the stage and leave the conclusions to the audience. So what I'm going to ask is I'm going to ask for a couple of hardy volunteers who want to give this a try. Come up with a, come up with a noun, and then just three or four sentences in which you do not use the noun. You're playing a character talking to somebody else. 
and we figure out what the noun must be uh, from the context. Does uh, anybody? Uh, there you go. All right. So, but we we have microphones up here. We don't have we don't have microphones back there. Plus, 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 we have we have a camera here so that people can uh, can, can admire. <laughs> you're, 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 well, that's, okay, all right. So, so you get the idea of this, right? I think so. Okay. So, so uh, she waited for me at the door. Mm -hmm. When I got in, I ignored her because I felt so guilty. And then I turned my coverlet down, and she had left some. Close. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going, to, I'm going to point something out. You did it all in the past tense. Oh, shit. We're broadcasting. That's probably what the dog was doing. I think I was in for that, though. Yeah, okay. Yes, oh, no, no, you no. um, Yeah, okay, but, but, but I know it's not, it's not automatic, no, but it's, it's like learning to ride a bicycle. Once you do it once consciously, you do it forever after. The, but, but, okay, cool. Next, uh, uh, somebody else give it a try? Okay, come on up. So I'm getting married in September, and I'm excited about that, mm -hmm. but I'm not only into jewelry. But it's not even being about into jewelry, it's like when you put the thing on, it you feel constricted. Like I'm afraid, when my mother, I hope my mother didn't see this, but at one point in her life she got too fat and she couldn't take it off. Okay. <laughs> and the object is? A wedding ring. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, it's that fine old American tradition, the, the, the wedding corset, you know, with, with, with this corset I do the uh, with. All right, anyway, so that's, that's the basic idea, is the, uh, this, is, this is a game that I came up with in order to, it's, this, this is, we, we've improvised it, but do you see how this is a writing principle? You see how you can get, you can use the unspoken to uh, uh, to create the circumstances under which the audience leans forward and supplies the uh, um, the unspoken word, and that means that they're invested in that and in in that and that they're participating. Does anybody else want to try one? Anyway, I see, I see people go. Oh, he's looking at me. No, <laughs> don't do that. Oh, don't. I, I think I'm down. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Sweet, we're really glad you've come today. Um, her office is right down the hall. Um, she is a veteran of the Gulf War, so I recommend when you come in, you don't mention the display, but just bring uh, her attention to it, that you admire that sort of work, and maybe bring up your marksman experience as well. That might help you with the interviews. I didn't say anything, but good luck. And she's a great lady. Don't. It'll be great. <laughs> Okay, I am stumped. Who, 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 who got it? I, I missed part of what she said, and I think that was the key. Oh, about the that, um, it's about the display. Okay, that's about the display. Mention something about the marksman, the ah, display, okay. and, and mention the fact that you're a marksman as well. That might be a good in at the end of this. Okay, I'm trying. I guess I'm. I'm Is it I'm, the I'm, gun that's the object? Yeah, that there's a gun. There's. there's um, oh, okay. The, the display. Okay, see, case. for 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 a second there, I got, I got lost on Sarah Palin. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> see. Then it would have been a helicopter yeah. and there would have been deer down below. That's right, and, 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 and blood in the snow. Well, All right. Sorry. The vision was that behind her desk is, is a display, is a gun ah. display. And she's a marksman and a, and a, and a golf OK, player. well, the gun, the, the, the gun I didn't, I, I, I actually was in my mind, but I, was, I thought you were playing an even subtler game on me. <laughs> but thank you, yes. <laughs> did, did, but did, you get the idea, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, the same thing applies, the idea of the power of the unspoken word applies uh, to something called the power of the unarticulated objective. Okay? What I mean by that is we, we're, we're, so, we're so, so used to, in a, in a lot of plays, people just barreling on stage and saying exactly what they want, and then the, the, the material of the piece is kind of over pretty quickly, isn't it? Because people will say, I want this, and the other person will say, great, you've got it, or no. You know, and they'll argue a little bit, and the scene will be over. But in fact, uh, an awful lot of the time, uh, either characters come on stage uh, trying to get what they want without asking for what they want directly, but trying to create the circumstances under which they will get what they want. Or sometimes characters are not 
conscious of what they want in the same way the writer does, the, the writer is. You know, characters do sometimes uh, operate out of uh, uh, subconscious uh, uh, objectives. So the idea of this is, uh, is um, uh, something called the power of the, um, uh, the unarticulated objective. I'm wondering if there is anybody in here who is reasonably confident of, I'd love to have a, a man and a woman who, uh, who can improvise a little bit. Okay, there you go. Okay, if I can, I, do, do you want to take another crack here? Nobody else does. Absolutely. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. Is I'm, going to, I'm going to set up a situation. I'm going to give you a few concrete uh, uh, pieces of information. And then each of you will go out of the room, and I will uh, privately, although I will be sharing it with, with the camera and with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the audience here, what your objective is out of her and what your objective is out of him. All right? Okay, so this is, th this is what the situation is going to be. Um, your brother and sister. Okay, every summer you come to this cottage and, uh, and, and, and join your parents for a week. Uh, and this is probably the last summer that's going to happen because dad's kind of failing. All right. Um, you're recently divorced. They're not real that thrilled with it. Thing. Hmm? That wedding ring thing. <laughs> Possibly. Well, yes, this is the sequel. Yeah, right. But I, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Part two. Yeah. Uh, you, you do very well in real estate. Okay? You're doing, you're doing really well in real estate. So the scene is going to take place in the, in the uh, kitchen of the, uh, of the cottage. It's the morning after he's arrived very late. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to go out of the room and to make certain that you can't hear. Uh, uh, no. uh, oh, okay. I see. Terry. Okay. All right. Here's here's the thing. Um, you, the divorce has left you strapped. Okay. You're trying to make a new start. You have a business opportunity if you can get your hands on ten grand. Um, you don't have ten grand. She has ten grand. <laughs> uh, you would love to. You would love it if, if, if she could. She's not going to give it to you, but you know, wouldn't it be nice if she could lend it to you, right? But you were trying to figure out a way of getting her to offer it without asking for it. All right. Now remember that you don't just go pile driving in on an objective. You have to find out what her frame of mind is, in order to figure out what your best route is, right? But that's basically it, is you want a loan. You want her to offer you a loan. You don't want to ask her for it. You want her to offer it. All right? Cool. Okay, go on out. Hello. He has done something to really piss you off, okay? You can, you can decide for yourself whatever it is that he's done that that's, that's, you think is really, you know. Have you told him what he's done? No, 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 no. Okay. You, have to, you, know, you, 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 you can decide mm -hmm. what, what he's done, okay? Uh, and what you want is uh, you want an apology from him. Now, you don't ask for the apology. Just create the circumstances under which he will volunteer an apology. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that the, this is kitchen, it's a, it's in the morning, you're uh, yeah, you're doing thing, you've you you've just come down, you haven't actually seen each other um, probably for, for many months. All right. So this is the first time you've seen each other, and you're, in the, you're here. We are. Fire away. Let's see what we got. Well, I'd offer you some coffee, but you probably just finished. Uh, no, I just woke up. No, well, you just got here. You look good. Uh, you look thin. Yes. <laughs> 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 you look thin. Oh, you always use that. You think that's going to just make up for everything? Okay. Fine. So are you, are you hungry? Because I made I made some cupcakes. 
It's 9 a.m. I know, but I started make I, I make good cupcakes, and they're just little baby cupcakes. Since when am I not diabetic? <coughs> Are you trying to kill me? <laughs> just try try the cupcakes. Uh, no, they're good. People love them. Like people really love them. Um. <laughs> <laughs> they're good, huh? People have told me that I should sell them. Well, you should do something. Uh. I want to do something. I want to. I want to sell cupcakes. I'm gonna sell cupcakes. So, cupcakes would be a manual job. You wouldn't have to talk. Ooh. What? Why are you, what are you talking about? I, I. I'm just thinking that maybe you should go into something where you don't. You don't speak out of turn, where you don't blast something that you might have heard and say it inappropriately. I just I think a job making cupcakes might suit you very well. Good. That's great. I, yeah. I just, as soon as I get the money, I'll be making cupcakes. Oh, money you want. Uh-huh. I, I say that. <laughs> I'm not asking for money. I'm, I'm just saying I have to get the money before I can do the cupcakes. Well, you have to prove yourself before you can get the money, and you got here so late. We were discussing selling the house last night. I don't think we want to bring it up again. So I wouldn't hope for money from the house for the cupcakes, if that happens to be what you're thinking. I'm not asking for money. Okay. But they're good, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're good. Well, I think we got a stalemate, but it was darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so what? What do you think she wanted? Um, what, 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 were you, what were you getting from her that you, that you, that you thought her objective was? That I. What kind of information was she giving you? Um, I'm apparently a bad, neglectful brother. Uh huh. And what would a bad, neglectful brother do? Not participate in familial things. No. Okay, no, but what, what, what would, what, what, in order to satisfy her, what would you have to do if, if you're bad and neglectful? <laughs> when you do something bad, oh, what, apologize. Yes, there you go. All right. And you, so good at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do it all the time. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you figured out what, what he was up to pretty quickly. Um, uh, his yeah. objective. Yeah. Yeah. Sponsorship, I guess. Well, uh, when, yeah. money. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> you see how even though they didn't go overtly for their objective, that they they that they uh, uh, this 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 fueled their behavior. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, uh, a a anybody have any questions about any of this so so far, or want to want to raise anything <coughs> about this? What, what you get when people are pursuing unarticulated objectives is you get uh, subtext, that valuable thing called subtext. It's, uh, it's the stuff that the audience is meant to figure out uh, underneath, uh, underneath the actions. Now something interesting happened in the scene, which I had not uh, anticipated, but I'm delighted that you brought it up, which is uh, you introduced an object. You introduced cupcakes. And why is this important? Well, this brings us to uh, another another game, something else that uh, 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 Viola pioneered uh, 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 talking about, and which I've uh, adapted to playwriting. Something called um, negotiating over an object. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, let me let me let me take you back to grade school. Okay, let me take you back to uh, to something that I find most people experienced in grade school which was uh, uh, during a science class, the teacher brought out a bar magnet. Remember that? Bar magnet, put a piece of cardboard or paper on top of the bar magnet and then dumped iron filings on top of that. Do you remember what happened to the iron filings? They, they, they formed sort of uh, almost semicircles around the end of the bar magnet, right? Now what shape did the filings make? Do you remember? What, you remember them, they're making that sort of semicircular shape why are, they, why are they making that shape? Remember? Because it's a horseshoe. Huh? You said it was a horseshoe. 
No, no, it's a straight magnet. Oh, okay. Straight magnet. That's what the, my my mime abilities I see here. Yeah, it's the magnetic field. You cannot see a magnetic field. Magnetic field, by definition, is invisible. But you can see the effect of a magnetic field on the filings. So you can see the shape of the iron filings. You can see the shape of the magnetic field through the effect on the iron filings. Now, I suggest that in scenes, we frequently have the emotional equivalent of a magnetic field. What's going on between the people? And if you use an object correctly on stage, you can convey an enormous amount about what's going on between the characters through the way they use the object. Uh, uh, we, we had a little incident of this uh, rather spontaneously, of uh, scraping off the, uh, the, icing. the icing off the, off, the, off the cupcake, which was a wonderful detail. So um, if you introduce an object, an object isn't just there for, uh, uh, to, you know, to decorate to, to decorate the set. An object has got a tremendously useful purpose in revealing what's going on politically between the characters on a stage. So, uh, for instance, uh, is everybody's familiar with the Odd Couple. Mm -hmm. Okay, beginning of the third act of the Odd Couple. Oscar is furious at Felix. Oscar is furious at Felix because Felix has screwed up the sure thing double date with the Pigeon Sisters, if you remember and they have not been speaking to each other. Uh, and Felix has made a, uh, a plate of food. And Oscar picks up an air freshener, <laughs> which is an object associated with Felix. And he goes around the room and goes spraying around the room until finally he sprays Felix's plate of food. And he says, there, I hope you like that on your spaghetti. Mm -hmm. And Felix says, ha ha, that's not spaghetti, that's linguine. And Oscar picks up the plate, goes to the kitchen door, kicks open the kitchen door, and hurls the plate against uh, a, a, an offstage unseen wall and says, now it's garbage. Felix goes to the door, looks at the mess that's evidently on the wall, and says, I'm not cleaning that up. And Oscar says, good. And Felix says, I'm not going to touch that. It's just going to harden up there and get all yucky, and the roaches will come out. And Oscar says, I kind of like it. And Felix says, you, you wouldn't touch it, would you? And Oscar says, no. Felix says, I'm, I'm cleaning that up. And Oscar says, if you touch one strand of whatever the hell that is, I'll break your head. OK, notice that nowhere in there do they explicitly articulate how they feel about each other. What happens is that they negotiate over the objects. They deal with the objects. Uh, Oscar first takes an object that's associated with Felix, the air freshener, and uses it in a way that is inappropriate for the object. You do not use uh, an air freshener to as a garnish on, on pasta, right? Instantly, by using an object for a purpose for which it is not intended, it piques the audience's interest. There's a whole TV series that was based on this. I can't say that I ever watched it, but MacGyver was, was all, always based on right to mm -hmm. you're taking, you're taking objects and using them for unusual purposes, right? Transforming objects. Um, or the, uh, and then you have the, the, the destruction of the object, right? The, 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 the linguini was destroyed. Destroying an object is, is also always punctuation. And it was an index of how angry these people are at each other. But there's, a, there's another transformation in there, which was there was a transformation of the name. Oscar says, I hope you like that on your spaghetti. And Felix says, ha, 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 that's linguine. Why is that line in there? What does it tell us? Yeah. Prescient. Smarter, yes. It's, it's, it's his way of, uh, of one-upping Oscar by saying, yeah. I'm more sophisticated than you are about food. And Oscar basically, by picking up the, the, the plate and throwing it against the wall and saying, now it's garbage, is saying, so much for your sophistication. I can, you know, brute force will trump sophistication yeah. any time. Right? So that's, that's a fairly short passage. And I don't know if, uh, if Neil Simon thought of it as analytically as I have. Possibly not, but uh, that's an enormous amount of information 
uh, conveyed through the negotiation over the objects, and these guys have not said to each other, I'm really, really mad at you. They don't have to. We can figure it out through the negotiation over the objects. So this is, uh, this is something that is, uh, related to some of the other games that Viola Spolin uh, would uh, do, which is to uh, set up an object, set up a couple of characters, and the characters would find out who they are through the way they negotiated over the object. We got some of that in uh, the little uh, the, the scene that we just did with the, with the cupcake, using the cupcake. The cupcake became not just a cupcake, it became a symbol of his hopes, right? And her scraping off the, uh, off the top, modifying the cupcake, was almost as if she were, uh, 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 and also taking a very tiny bite, was, was her way of uh, registering her feelings about his, uh, about his hopes and, uh, and objectives. Oh. Yeah. And also how much she loves him, because she mentions he's not being diabetic, but she's still willing to give his cupcakes a try. Mm -hmm. That... Uh, so. Well, that, 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 that might be a, 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 a literary Maybe analysis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, no, no. I'm, no, I'm saying, here's the, here's the interesting thing, though. Here's the interesting thing. This is something that I find fascinating, is that things that are arrived at spontaneously in, 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 uh, in improvisation, in, in, in rehearsal, or sometimes in, uh, in writing where people are not thinking about these meanings at all, they get analyzed and they're right, even though that they didn't occur to them. Does everybody know the uh, 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 On the Waterfront, the movie On the Waterfront? Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous scene between um, Marlon Brando and Eve Marie Saint. So it's one long take. It's one of the great scenes in movies. And he's walking along with her, and they were rehearsing the scene, and he's walking along with her, and they, they get, they're, they're, they're near a swing set. They're past a swing set. And she's got these gloves. Remember, she's a Catholic school girl, and she's got these gloves. Well, as they were rehearsing it, she dropped the glove. And Brando reached down and took the glove, and he started doing stuff with it. And Kazan, who, Elia Kazan, who was the director, said, oh, that's great. We have to keep it in. So now if you watch the movie, take a look at what happens. She's walking along. She's got the glove. She drops the glove. He reaches down. He picks up the glove. He sits down on the swing, and instead of giving her the glove back, he starts taking the schmutz off the glove, right? She looks away, and as she looks away, he puts the glove on. He's a boxer. He's put this lady's glove on. She turns to see he's got the glove, and he's making these gestures, and, the, and she's got a, she's thinking, how the hell do I get the glove off of him, right? And the whole rest of the scene, as they're, as they're talking to each other, she's trying to figure out how to get the glove off until finally at the end of the scene she gets her courage up and gets the glove off. This is known now, it's a famous scene, it's the glove scene. It was not in the text. Bud Schulberg did not write it. When they did a, a stage version of it on Broadway, uh, what was it, eight or ten years ago, they didn't use the glove because it wasn't in the text and they had no right to it. It was something that Brando and Eve Marie Saint invented and Kazan was smart enough to use. We don't remember a word of the scene. All we do is we watch the glove. Okay, let's do literary analysis. You know, I guarantee you, Brando didn't think for a second about what the glove meant. But what are we looking at? We're looking at this guy who's a palooka, and he's trying on his feminine side. That's a logical reading. You know, it may... He might have laughed in your face if you had said that. But still, it's a logical, it's a logical way to look at the scene. And it certainly creates this, this tension, because on some level, there's, it's, there's also a kind of violation of, of, of him taking her glove. You know, it's, it's something that's hers, and he's putting his hand inside it. This could go, mm, you know... Yeah. Yeah, uh, for people at home, people like in the audience are going, Ugh. okay. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember, but you might find symbolism in that. I don't know. All right. Um, and, and Brando did this throughout his career. If you watch Brando movies, you will see time and again, he will yank objects into the scene. And frequently, they are not things that, are, that, that were in, 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 in the original script. There was a scene, uh, did you ever, uh, have you ever seen, it's a fairly terrible movie, but it's got a great scene, and it's Missouri Breaks. You ever seen that? It's a Western. Brando plays an outlaw. He's a killer. He has killed a man. The man, there's a funeral going on for the man. The man is lying in his coffin, and it's, since it's a summer day, the coffin is filled with ice. <laughs> and Brando, Brando comes, comes, comes in and says, you know, this didn't have to happen. 
this man didn't have, this didn't have to happen. If he hadn't, you know, gotten my face here, if he hadn't challenged me, he, he, would be, he would be here with you right now. He'd be sitting up with you and talking with us right now. And he reaches in and he grabs the corpse and he starts almost doing a, 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 a ventriloquist routine with him. And then at the, at, at, as he's finished, he sort of lets the corpse fall back down into the, into the coffin. He's established that he has a toothache, so he reaches and he takes a piece of ice, steals a piece of ice from the coffin, and walks off with a, with a piece of ice against his tooth. Now, this is outrageous. It's also a great scene. You know, and any of you who've seen Last Tango in Paris, all I have to do is say butter, you know, where, where we are, right? He does this all the time. What was it, the Don Juan DeMarco? Do you remember that one? Was it, was it Johnny Depp and uh, who was it? Uh, do you remember, do you remember the, the popcorn? The popcorn in bed with Faye Dunaway? Oh, sure, he loves playing with his food. <laughs> and, and, but but, take, but take, a look at, uh, take a look at Streetcar. I'm convinced that some of the things that we now accept as in the script of Streetcar are things that he came up with in rehearsal and, and William said, oh, can I use that? Yeah, sure, take it. Stuff like, can I have a drag off your cigarette? You remember the second, the second scene, the trunk scene? Mm -hmm. The trunk scene's got something like 20 objects. You want to have a small lesson in the value of, uh, of objects in playwriting? Take out the uh, scene two uh, of, uh, of Streetcar and write down every object and take a look at how the objects are used and what they tell us about the characters without being forced. So I'm going to bet that somewhere along the line, uh, they were playing, and uh, and and uh, and and, and uh, Blanche uh, can, said, "Can I have a, a, a drag off your cigarette?" And, he, uh, and instead of taking the cigarette out of his mouth, he says, "Here, have one of your own." That tells you something. It tells you something about who is this woman who, uh, on on brief familiarity, will take a, a cigarette from her brother-in-law's mouth and put it into her own mouth, and the fact that he's refusing to do that, but gives her one of her own. Or do you remember at a certain point she says, my, you have a, you have a fine judicial air, and she's got the, um, she's got the uh, air, air, aerosol or whatever it is. But what, what's the thing that you spray? Atomizer. About? Atomizer. And, and she starts spritzing with him playfully. He knocks it out of her hand. I wouldn't be surprised if they found that in rehearsal. That looks to me like business that could have been found. It's now a permanent part of the play. But if, as soon as you bring an object into the scene, You've got, you've got something for people to negotiate over. You can make more vivid the nature of the relationship between the characters. At the end of that scene, do you remember, he says, well, where are the papers? If you recall, that she's, they've lost Belle Reeve, the, the, the family's mansion. He says, well, look, where are the papers? Are they in the trunk? And, and she says, everything I have is in the trunk. And so he, he reaches in and she grabs something. He grabs a, a package of something. She grabs them back. And he says, well, what are those? She says, she, she, she says now, that, now that you've touched them, I have to burn them. Her letters from my dead husband. Now that you've touched them, I have to burn them. Why? What is the audience thinking? Now that he's touched these letters, by touching them, what has he done to the letters? He's contaminated. Okay, which makes him what? Dirty. Yeah, he's filth. Instead of saying, you're filth, she says, now that you've touched them, I have to burn them, and the audience does the work. This is what she thinks about this guy. It, this, is, this is filled with am amazing stuff, but it's all by implication. It, and it comes out of uh, whether or not he ever heard of Viola Spolin, or, or, and I, probably, I think he probably didn't, but he's, uh, he's using a, te a technique that Spolin used in, uh, in teaching uh, theater games, which is creating the relationship between characters through the way they negotiate over objects. So they can either negotiate over an object that says substantially the same, or they can transform the object, or they can destroy the object. One of my favorite scenes in all of dramatic literature is from Henry VI, Part Two. Everybody applauds, because everybody knows this, this play backwards and forwards, right? OK, give yourself a pleasure. Yeah, you know, all the history plays are amazing. Henry VI, Part Two's got maybe the first scene in it the great scene that Shakespeare wrote. I think we, they, we think that he wrote it when he was like 22 or 23. Okay, it's a great scene. Here's the setup. Margaret is a minor French princess who has been married uh, off to Henry VI. Henry VI has got the sex drive of a flea. She finds herself interested in other people. This triggers a civil war uh, in which uh, one, of the, one of the local lords, uh, York, 
rises up against uh, Henry VI. Uh, Margaret says to Henry VI, you're useless in a battle. Will you please go sit up under a tree? Try not to get caught. Uh, uh, and she straps on armor, and she leads the charge herself. One of her warlords captures York and drags York before her and says to her, what do you want me to do with him? She says, stand him on that molehill over there. Why on a molehill? What is a molehill? It is a little elevation. She's mocking his ambition by standing him on the molehill. Okay, so she says to him, so you wanted to be king, huh? Wanted to be king. Gee, if he wants to be king, he should have. Anybody got a piece of paper? So somebody hands her a parchment, and she makes a paper crown, and she puts it on his head, and she says, oh, now you look like a king. Doesn't he look like a king? He's got the jaw for it, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, you look like a king. She says, oh, you're feeling a little misty, moisty, a little upset, a little, <coughs> little, little down in the dumps. And she says, here, use, 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 use my handkerchief to dry thy tears withal. Oh, don't mind the red stuff on the handkerchief. That's the blood of your youngest son. We killed him this morning. Oh. It's a great scene. <laughs> it's a killer scene. <clears throat> so what has Shakespeare done? This 23-year-old upstart. In fact, that's what he was called by one of the contemporary playwrights who saw this scene. They called him the upstart crow because they were envious of how good this scene was. The upstart crow, this Shakespeare scene, this Shakespeare, this upstart crow. What did, what, what, what did, he, what did he do? He took an object... In both cases, he took objects and compromised them, and by compromising them, he, he created a, a new meaning. It's a, it's a crown that is not a crown. A crown that is made of paper is worth nothing. His pretensions to the throne are worth nothing. She's mocking him with the paper crown, right? It's paper that has been cut into the shape of a... It's, it's, it's an insult. And then, by handing him a napkin, which is traditionally a symbol of concern, of, of sympathy, yes? And she poisons that by informing him that they have murdered his youngest son and that the red of the napkin is the blood of his, of his youngest son. So it, it, it compromises that object. It's an extraordinary scene. It's, it's in a really sophisticated scene. Now, please notice that I am avoiding the use of the word symbol. Uh, whenever I'm teaching writing and somebody says, oh, did you notice the symbols? I, go, I just cringe. Because a symbol, it seems to me, it's, it's like vitamin-enriched bread. You know, it's like meaning that has been injected from without by a pretentious writer. If you have objects that are in there that are organic to the power plays that are going on with the characters as it is, you don't have to look for symbols. The symbols will arise organically out of the action between the characters. You don't have to inject anything. It's one of the things that drives me crazy about some Eugene O'Neill, who's, you know, okay, he's one of my gods, but every now and then, you know, he just hammers it home. He, has, he tells you what... The, he announces a symbol, and then he comes back to it and clangs a gong behind it. You know, morning becomes a lecture. Everybody talks about, oh, the islands, the island. Hey, give it a rest. You know, well, we can figure this stuff out. That's the thing is, people figure it out. We're fast now. We've been watching television, right? When I was a kid, TV commercials were, believe it or not, 60 seconds long. They were a minute long. TV commercials now are, what, 15 seconds? That's a long TV commercial. And people get it. They get the message. They get the imagery. They put it together. It doesn't all have to be explained. We are thinking, I'm not saying we're thinking more deeply than we used to, but we're thinking faster. We're coming to conclusions faster. And that's one of the things that, uh, that an audience does, is it comes to conclusions swiftly on the basis of, uh, of the behavior that's in, in front of them. So you have... Um, you have uh, 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 people can negotiate over objects to, uh, to make vivid uh, um, the relationships between them. I'm going, to, I'm going to volunteer you now for something, all right? Just me? Yes, just you. Okay. We, we, we're, we're, going to, we're going to do a short scene, and I'm going to give you the lines, and it's the same scene 
uh, uh, again and again, all right? You're going to say, do you love me? And I'm going to say yes, okay? okay? So that's the, it's, it's, it's not my best writing, but, <laughs> okay. but, 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 okay, <clears throat> so, uh, and say it the same way each time, okay? Okay, okay so just start. Well, do you love me? Yes. Okay, version two. Okay. Do you love me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> same text, different meaning, why? What's the, what's the difference? Hmm? But, 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 but what, what's happened? Just the space. That's it. It's called negotiation over space. Mm -hmm. That's all blocking really is, is negotiation over space. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Go online. You can see the rest. Mm -hmm. You can see us talk about you. No, all right. Anyway. Uh, anyway. Um, so we can, this is sometimes when we're writing, we forget that we can prescribe certain spatial things in the script. Negotiating over space is terribly important. There's a point when uh, when uh, Blanche is uh, uh, is trying to cross the room, and she and she tells Stanley to move back. He says, "You've got plenty of room." Well, of course he she doesn't. So space, we can negotiate over space. Okay, here's uh, here's version version three. Okay. Oh, do you love me? Yes, version four. Do you love me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So what was the difference there? Time. 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 We can negotiate over time. So we can negotiate over space. We can negotiate over time. We can negotiate over light. The quality of light, the intensity of the light. We can negotiate over sound. We can negotiate over temperature. Have you ever worked with somebody whose sense of comfort is 10 degrees off from yours? Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. um, Julie Andrews, a number of years ago, was doing a musical called Victor Victoria on Broadway. And since she was brought up in an England that had no central heating, her sense of comfort, what was comfortable for her, and the, the temperature at which she performed best, at which she sang best, was a good 10 degrees cooler than what was comfortable for the cast. And she apologized to the cast, particularly to the dancers who were racking up injuries from being mm -hmm. cold. But this is how she got to hit her high notes, you know, which is what the audience was paying for. So uh, we negotiate over, over I, I, have, I have this problem with, with, uh, with my wife, for that matter, which is that I, I have this, this tendency to enjoy a sort of a cocoon-like feeling when I'm writing. And I'm sitting there having a wonderful time writing away, and she comes in and she says, can't you get some air into this place? Get, you know, it's, 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 it's baking in here. And, you know, so we, we you know, turn on fans and mm -hmm. I get cold. Well, they used to call it England, now it's hot flashes. I'm sorry. It used to be England was the excuse. Oh, I was raised in England. It's hot flashes. Ah, now it's hot flashing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, okay. Well, that makes it. That, that, that makes a difference. So anyway, there we are. We got we got uh, uh, negotiating over temperature. So you see all these mediums of negotiation that we have, that uh, that we frequently don't think about when we're writing. We've got all this stuff, all this stuff that we can pull into play, and Viola's got games. Uh, that are related to a lot of these things. Uh, she has another game which I love called What's Beyond? And the idea is a scene is going on in this room and something is happening outside the room that they never refer to, but it absolutely informs the behavior of the people in the room. Again, it's by implication, right? Why is everybody speaking so quietly here? You know. Are they afraid of being discovered? Or you, you, so what's beyond is another, is another game that she has, is this idea of creating a reality outside the room. This, this can also be uh, translated into another game, which I love, which is characterizing somebody who is not on stage. Does everybody know Tartuffe, the play Tartuffe, Moliere? Do you know when Tartuffe enters the play? In five out of five acts, what act he, he makes his entrance? Okay. It's act three. 
But by the time he comes on, he has been thoroughly characterized because of his effect on the politics of the rest of the people in the House. It's the title character. He's the title character, and he comes on uh, two-fifths of the way through the play. You know, it's the star part. Hickey. Hmm? Hickey. Hickey yeah, comes on when? At the end of Act One, is it? Pre, 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 it's a three-act play. Yeah, it's, it's, like it's, in. yeah it's, it's, a, it's a long way in. Also, for that matter, um, uh, that's an Iceman cometh, for those of you who thought that we were talking about, you know, <laughs> evidence of, of kisses. Uh, no, uh, um, the front page? Everybody know the front page? Mm -hmm. Walter Burns, the SOB uh, editor. Do you know when he comes on? And, and, and he's the star part. Robert Ryan played him on Broadway. He's the star but in, the, in the Great Revival. He's the star part. Do you know where in the three-act play Walter Burns arrives in the front page? At the end of the second act, he has about 40 minutes worth of action in the play, and yet it's the star role. Yet we are totally prepared for who he is by the way people react to his name being mentioned, or the prospect of, uh, or the fact that somebody is talking to him on the other end of a, of a, of a, uh, a telephone. Characterization is not just what a character does; it is how other people treat the character, or how other people react in the presence of the character. Um, there is a game. which is closely related to a children's game that Viola used called Who Am I? And the Who Am I game is somebody is brought into a room not knowing who they are. First somebody's taken out of the room as we, we took it. Somebody's taken out of the room and everybody in the room decides who this person is. And that person is brought in and then one after another the different actors come up and treat this person in, in, a, in an appropriate manner. And, this, and the person has no idea who they are except from the clues of how they're being treated. You know, if somebody comes in and says, um, the morning mail, ma'am, you know, with a, a, it's on a silver platter, that's one thing. Or if somebody comes in and says, I see ashes in the corner, are you going to clean that up? Okay. So characters are not just defined by what they do or how they behave. They are also defined uh, very largely by how other characters uh, treat them. I think that um, I'm, I'm very vague on this because I haven't seen it in a long time. I think there's a character in HMS Pinafore who is the villain. And he's never done anything particularly wrong. It's just since everybody else in the play chooses to treat him as a villain, he's he sort of acknowledges, I guess I must be the villain of the piece because every show has got to have a villain and everybody seems to not like me, so it must mean that I'm the villain, so I must do villainy stuff. You know, it's a wonderful joke on, uh, on, this, whole, on this whole concept. I'm going to pause for breath for a second and also ch to check and see how we're doing in terms of our time. How are we doing in terms of our time? How, how much time do we have left? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, to, to find out if, if there's anything that anybody wants to, to ask about this, either about any of the techniques that I've laid out or about improvisation or about the history of it. Your, your hand was up first. Um, I would imagine that, like the way you talked about the vitamin injecting from the outside, all of these techniques have applied sort of unconsciously don't work as well as just being practiced at it. No, so no, no, no. You can, you can apply these techniques consciously. <laughs> Would it be helpful to take improv classes as actors? Oh, Is that yes. Like Absolutely. Do you teach something like that? Well, <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, as, as a matter, I, I do sometimes, but actually, if, if you're interested, for those of you who are interested in, in, in this, uh, every summer for like the last 19 years, uh, my wife has uh, put together this call, something called the Summer Improv Retreat. And we get the guy who founded the Groundlings, and we get senior faculty from Second City, and me, and some other people. And we uh, take over a, a, a hotel, in, usually in the Catskills, and we just work for a week doing this stuff. And, uh, and, and doing scene building. I, uh, I build to a point where people are able to improvise um, uh, one-act plays. We do an evening of, uh, of, of improvised one-act plays. 
And it, this stuff does not have to be comic. <coughs> People hear improv and they think, oh, I, instantly it's got to be, it's got to be comic. You know why improvisation usually is funny? Because actors are scared to death up there, and they want to have affirmation that they're making contact. So if they do something they, that the, with the intention of being funny, and they get feedback from the audience with laughter, then they're reassured. If you're improvising drama up there, how are you going to know if you're landing? You don't hear people, you know, having catharsis. Is, in, is it catharsis or catharsis? Whatever, out, out in the audience. But one of the one, one of the best scenes I ever saw in in, in a work, in one of the workshops that I was doing this is I mean this must be 15 years ago and yet it's still vivid to me. It's a scene that um, here's the way we do it is I'm teaching the techniques, some, something similar to what we did with the, the brother sister scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm teaching the techniques and then uh, the the uh, group is divided up into three: two actors and one director slash writer uh, per, for each unit. And the director slash writer sets up a relationship, some past history and givens, and gives each character a, uh, a, an unspoken objective. And then we're ready to have a scene. Now, here's, here's the key thing about an unspoken objective in this thing, which is you're more likely to have a workable scene if a deal is possible. Mm -hmm. A deal was possible in this scene. Yeah. What, what was the deal? Apology for money. Yes, exactly. If he sold his apology. So it's more likely to work if the deal is possible. If a deal is possible. It doesn't mean that the deal has to be struck, but the audience gets a sense of, oh, a deal is possible. So if you're setting, and this is, this is scene construction too. I, I, I promise you, this is, this is scene construction. This is, relates yeah, to how setting up the scene. Huh? You could definitely see it. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel that as writers, um, it, it becomes more sort of ingrained in second nature if we were to go out as actors in an improv yeah, or it, it, to be it, the writer director. It, 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 be, it becomes, it, uh, I think the, uh, you have to act. You have to do it. You have to get up and, and, and do it. Uh, let, me, let me tell you about this one scene though I was telling you about. This is a scene, this is between a 14 year old boy who came to the camp and a guy who was in his 50s who was a professional <laughs> actor in Philadelphia. Okay, they'd never met each other before. And somebody set up a scene in which the kid lived on a farm with his mother. His father had died a year ago, and the man is the next door neighbor who lives on the, on, on, on the farm next door. And this guy has been helping them for the past year. A year has passed, and now this guy wants the kid's permission to court his mother. Um, and it was one of the most beautiful scenes. I, it was like a, 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 it was like discovering a fine one-act play by Horton Foot. The deference that the older man showed the boy, the responsibility that the boy felt to act like an adult and to get it right. It was an extraordinary scene. There were no laughs in it. It was improvised. Gorgeous scene. Wonderful scene. Remember, there was another scene that was, um, uh, I was teaching a group of people from the actor's studio. And uh, there was another scene in which this woman wakes up. I can't remember what the objectives were, but here's, here's what the scene turned out to be. A woman wakes up. She, uh, she has been at a bar the night before. She has gone home with this guy. She got drunk and went home with this guy. And she was hanging out in a fairly fancy bar, so she thought that she, you know, had ended up with somebody with a couple of bucks in his pocket. And she discovers that these guys have a friend who has no particular money. He's a bus driver, and she has just, her aim was off, and she went home <laughs> with the bus driver. Well, this guy thought that she was really into him. He thought this was the beginning of a real relationship, and her thing was just to sort of, oh, okay, screw that one up. So, and she, you know, she was just sort of shrugging off the night that she had spent with him, whereas he thought it was something special. She was up, oh, you know. Try to try to try to hook a rich guy and got a bus driver. Well, you win some, you lose some. Hey, your bus. Do you do you take that home with you? Do you have it parked out back? Could you give me a lift home? I mean, great scene, wonderful scene. So we moved to the point where at the end of the week we're putting up a, we put up an evening of these kinds of scenes. If you are interested in pursuing this. Um, I'll, I'll give you my uh, email address and I'll pass the pass the word along to. Um, to the people who organize this every year. Uh, my email address is DG, as in Dramatist Guild, mm -hmm. DG Sweet, Sweet being my last name, S W E E T, 
at AOL.com. Yes, I have AOL. I'm old. <laughs> so, but we do this every uh, every summer, and I also occasionally. What's it called? The summer. It's the summer improv retreat. Uh, I do this. Um, we've been doing this every summer for some, for like the last 19 years, and the and the uh, the teachers come and experiment with new techniques, and people build new characters and new scenes, and it's been it's 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 great fun. Do you, do you know the relation with the relationship? I mean, obviously, everyone always goes, "Oh, Mike Lee," you know. But there's also that whole oh. bunch of um, oh, yeah. makers who did um, Cyril, Cyril, whatever, John C. Riley and Rosa Tomei, and then the woman's done your sister, sister. There used to be called Mumblecore. Yeah. Lynn, what's her name? Shelby. Uh, I can't. I can't tell you the name. But Mike, Mike Lee, who I in fact once met, and who is a genius and one of the ruder people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh. But uh, but I'm I'm a huge fan of his. Mm -hmm. But for those of you who don't know Mike Lee, Mike Lee builds movies. Uh, he doesn't tell his actors uh, the stories of the movies that they're in. He improvises with them privately to find characters that he likes. Then he, he takes the best characters that each of these actors have come up with, and he writes a story that he keeps to himself. He writes an outline, and he shoots the movies in order, in chronological order. And if you, the, uh, uh, if you see a movie called Secrets and Lies, which was nominated for Best Picture, the stuff that you're seeing in there the, uh, uh, was shot the day that it was discovered. And people discovered who they were and what they were doing on the day that they were shooting the scenes. And the material was uh, developed improvisationally. The great scene between the mother and daughter uh, where Blethen. both Brenda Blethen and I'm forgetting the name of the Baptiste, black. Uh, yeah. Ja is it Marie, Marie Jean yeah. Baptiste? Yeah. That's it. Marie Jean Baptiste. They were both nominated for Oscars for that scene, which they built in the morning and shot that afternoon. One shot. They used to work with Tim Roth back in the early mean time or something. Right. And, 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 and anyway, but there's 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 a lot of ways of building stuff improvisationally. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, never mind. She has a question. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll come back to you when yeah, you. Actually, you know. no. I was going to say. Yeah. I have something above my desk that's a quote from Mike Nichols, which really, yeah. which you probably heard. He said every scene he got from working with Compass, every scene mm -hmm. has to be a negotiation, a, a fight, yeah. or a seduction. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and I, th I thought that's, and I, I, I saw him do a Times talk about yeah. uh, Death Was Hell, he said the same thing in the yeah. Times talk, and I, I th that's a great way. He, he, he was one of my, he's one of my teachers in my book. Yeah. There's a, it, my book is called Something Wonderful Right Away. It's, a, it's going to be reissued in, in a, year or so, a year or so from Northwestern University, but you can probably find a, a, a used copy someplace. But uh, Nichols was a big influence on me and has remained, uh, has remained a, a friend and somebody I, I, I ask about this stuff because he's got one of the great analytic minds in the business, but he came to it out of improvising. He, Elaine May would say that if a scene was dying, when in doubt, seduce, because that was always a scene. <laughs> So whenever a scene was dying, she would start to seduce because it was always a scene, because it was always an objective, right? Okay. Yes, you, you had a question. Yeah, if you're directing a short piece of how what exercises would you use to... Well, I mean, there are a number of different ways that people do this. I mean, some, sometimes... You just have, and this is as much actor's studio as it is Second City. Sometimes people will just, uh, so you say, put aside the, uh, put aside the script now. Improvise your way through it using your own words, and you will find new material, and you'll find new blocking. And then, uh, as, assuming that you, if, if you wrote it, and if you've got uh, 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 actors who will let you do it, you can uh, incorporate some of the some of the stuff that you find. Uh, you, you had a question. It's more of a comment. I mean, you go to a lot of readings, yeah. and they can be really boring. And then the audience is there, and their comments are all on the plot. Yeah. And basically, a lot of the issues with the readings are sort of what you're saying. It's like, there's no objects. There's no action. Well, you, no you know, here, 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 here's, here's the reason why that becomes a problem. This is where this comes, is that I believe that there are three levels of logic that have to obtain at all times during, uh, uh, during a scene, OK? One level of logic is the story that you want to tell, what the writer wants to tell. And you have to, that, ha that, that, that chain of logic has to be firm. But you also have to be able to have um, 
a chain of logic from the perspective of each of the characters. Mm -hmm. The characters must constantly be behaving in a way that is logical for them and that they believe advances their interest. And then the third level of logic is what the audience makes of it. So if you know exactly what you're doing and if the characters know exactly what they're doing but the audience is clueless, the piece doesn't work. You know? I was teaching, uh, I was teaching a, a, a writing course uh, uh, in Philadelphia at one point and I had a, a student who was writing a western. And um, there was a scene in this western where um, this bar fly, this, this sort of drunk in a bar, insults the most vicious, the most dangerous man in town and uh, gets shot by him, killed. And I said, okay, l let me ask you a couple of questions. Is the barfly new to town? No, no, he's been here for years. Is the dangerous man new to town? No, no, he's been here, here for years. Why is the barfly insulting the guy that he knows is the most dangerous man in town who is liable to kill him? Oh, because I need to have a scene in Boot Hill next scene. I said, no, no, that's your logic. I said, why, why is this guy doing something which is not in his interest? Why is he getting himself killed? Does he have a death wish? No. Then why is he doing it? Because I need the scene in Boot Hill, you see? So he, he was not thinking from the perspective of his, of his characters. You must always, at any point, be able to look at a, a script and see how everything a, a, any of the characters does, from their perspective, they think is advancing their own interests. They may be wrong, but they really think that uh, they're pursuing their, their objectives at any given time. If, if you ever have a character doing something just because you want something to happen, it's going to look hollow and unpersuasive. The audience is going to say, why is the character doing that? Oh, the, the writer's pushing the plot forward. Right, and you see that a lot in television. There's great series, and, yeah. and then they have a bad season, and it's usually that. Like, oh, they needed that to happen, so she gave the money to the church. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious about your process as a writer, knowing yeah. all yes. you do about this. When you sit sit down to write, <coughs> yeah. do you not have any kind of outline? Do you have just a notion of what you're going to write? Do you it, do it, this in rewriting? It, it really depends. Sometimes I start from improv. Sometimes I start uh, from, uh, from something that I've discovered uh, historically, and the story is going to be laid out because I've said, oh, this is an interesting story. And, uh, and I, I, the, the shape of it is my, my telling the story that I've discovered that I want, that I want to tell. Uh, sometimes I just just write something, but I these these techniques are, are so in my bones now that even when I'm writing, I'm to me when I'm writing I am transcribing the characters improvising in my mind and I'm just racing. I've actually now gotten to the point where I sometimes did you know about a program called Dragon Naturally Speaking dictation yeah. program? Yeah. I sometimes improvise dialogue into the in, in, into the computer uh, playing the, playing the parts. Then I go back and clean it up. But some of my best stuff has been just improvising into the, you know, not being self-conscious, just improvising into the computer. Uh, I'll give you an example of something. Um, a number of years ago, I was running a workshop. I had uh, actors and improvisers in the workshop, and uh, we had a room book for three hours. And at the end of two and a half hours, we had finished our work. We had done everything that, uh, uh, that people had brought in to work on. Well, we still had a half hour left, and I paid for the room, and I was damned if I was going to waste a half hour. So there were, I think, there were five of us in the room, all right? There were um, uh, two women and three men in the room. And I said, okay, let me set up a, let me set up a situation. Just flying by the seat of my pants, um, I, I said, okay, uh, here are, there are three couples who uh, have known each other for years, and every year they take a vacation together. And this year they arrive at, uh, at the cabin by the lake. I like cabins by the lake. <laughs> and uh, uh, only uh, one of the wives hasn't shown up. And this guy becomes convinced that his wife is not going to show up, and that this is the end of his marriage. And the other people who think this was going to be a vacation realize what they're going to do is deal, deal with their friend coping with the end of his marriage. So we started, uh, we started improvising it, and it works. It's pretty interesting. It seems to work. And I think, oh, there's a play here. So I think, OK, what do I want to do with this? I think, well, I think I would rather write more good parts for women than for men. So I'm just going to make it so that it's, a, it's, it's one of the men who hasn't shown up. And I want to do a small cast play. So instead of it being three couples, it'll be two couples. And so I got together with uh, an actress named Beth Links 
who also writes under the name of Arlene Hutton. I got together with Beth and uh, my wife, who at that point was my girlfriend, uh, Christine Niven, and I said, uh, I set up the circumstances for the first scene. This woman, is, her husband uh, is, not, is not showing up, and she's convinced this is the end of her marriage, and what was supposed to be a pleasant week is about to go to, go to hell. And so we improvised our way through a scene that was based on, on, on the beginning of the week, the, the woman realizing that her husband isn't going to show up. And I, um, <clears throat> I found five or six really good lines in that, including at one point, Beth said to me, God damn, Russ, now I have to make the pasta instead of the roast. Mm -hmm. I said, I, okay, I don't get it. I don't understand. She says, well, a roast, you, you, you have to time. If we knew that Russ was going to be here, then I could time it for when he was going to arrive, and we could have the roast. Pasta, on the other hand, you know, you can whip up. It's, 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 it's ready in, in, in 10, 15 minutes. And as soon as she said that to me, I said, oh, that's my objective correlative. I said, Pasta is what you do in an emergency. A roast is when you're secure and you have plans. And I knew that the play was going to end with her saying, tonight I can make the roast. Mm -hmm. It was a gift she gave me. She had no idea she was giving me that gift. As soon as I heard it, I said, that's the end of the play. Tonight I can make the roast. So I wrote the first scene. And then I got together with them again. And they gave me great material for the second scene. I wrote the second scene. I wrote the third scene just sitting on a train one day. You know, I knew what that scene was going to be about. And the fourth scene, I remember there was something that was going on personally where I was very, very irritated in my own personal life. And there was a scene in which the part that, uh, that my wife, Christine, was, was playing, that I was, she, she, was, she was saying, why, why, why are you, why, why would you consider doing it? Why, why would you do this thing? It, it, because my character was contemplating doing something that would disrupt her life considerably. And I suddenly exploded and I said, because you did the wrong thing. You did the wrong thing. What you did was wrong. It was not the right thing to do. It just came roaring out of me. I didn't know where it came from. But it was obviously something that was going on in me personally. And suddenly, and everybody in the room went, <gasps> and I thought, oh, I can use that. And it's, 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 <laughs> This explosion out of this guy who thinks that he's utterly rational, this rage that suddenly comes er erupting out of him, is shocking. And I bet I put that into the play. About maybe the 10 or 12 lines in the play that came out of improv, but they informed the rest of the play. If you're curious to read it, it's a play called With and Without. There's an acting edition, or there's an anthology of my plays called The Value of Names and Other Plays, including an essay uh, uh, about the writing. Each of my plays that's in there, and there are nine plays in there, has an essay about how the play, each of the plays were written or where they came from. But I, I've gotten to the point now, um, a couple years ago, I was sent sort of an email to a batch of my friends, because occasionally I just, you know, I've got a group of friends that I occasionally have a thought and I just send it out. I said, gee, one of the things I would have always wanted to do is to um, is to get some improvisers and some writers together in a remote place for a week. And all we'll do is we'll improvise based on each other's premises. And if I improvise something that's based on a premise that you've come up with, you record it. Anything I do is a gift to you, you can use in your play. Similarly, uh, anything that you do in response to my premise is a gift to me. And um, somebody on my list said, oh, I can make that happen. And she said, we've got a, a beautiful house in Chatham. You've got it for a week. Would you like five grand? You know, we can fly some people in. And she just, out of the blue, gave me five grand. And I flew in people, some of them, some of them well-known, some of them not. I flew in a, a, a couple I know that who were members of the Groundlings who co-wrote the book to a Sister Act and wrote Eight Years of Cheers. So, Stein Kellner? Huh? Bill the, and Sherry Steinkellner? Yeah, the Steinkellners. That's right. They also came to our summer improv retreat with a couple of their kids. Yeah. Um, uh, if, if you know those Simpsons, Dan Castellaneta and his wife, Deb, came in. Um, a guy named Ron West from Second City. There was an a, 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 a actress writer named uh, Catherine Butterfield. 
for my whose work I knew as a writer, and I had a hunch this would this would work for her. And she says, I'm not an improviser. I said, try. Turns out she was a terrific improviser. And we did this, uh, uh, not this last summer, but the summer before. Uh, two, two plays were finished out of that as well as uh, uh, three one acts, some of which are already. So I said, oh, this works. And so last summer, uh, 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 Deb and Dan and uh, 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 some other improvisers got together. And also, if you know uh, uh, um, Deborah, oh, I'm suddenly blanking her name, um, End Days. Laufer? Oh, Deb Laufer. Deb, Deb I've been hawking on her that she should come the previous summer, and she instead went to the O'Neill Center. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but she came this summer, and she had this extraordinary, she said, this is changing the way I've written. She got up, and she hadn't, she hadn't acted in years. She'd acted in one of my plays 15 years ago. But she got up, it turns out she's a fabulous improviser. And again, we had this extraordinary week. We've got another invitation to go to Chatham next summer. So this is going to be an annual thing, but we just work for a week. We improvise for four hours a day. We make certain that the house is in a pretty place so that we've got some place to visit. And then at night we have dinner and we write. And we, that's how we spent the week, and, uh, and it's an extraordinary week, extraordinarily productive week. So plays don't have to start with you at a keyboard. They can start uh, in an improv. They can start in, uh, in a suggestion. So. You have when another you question. Do, when you do your, when you mm. wrote things based on improvs with your girlfriend, now wife, and friends, mm -hmm. um, do you uh, sit at a table so that you can record it? I mean, how do you a? Well, we, uh, so, sometimes it's that. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we just have a good enough mic so that it'll pick stuff up. When we were improvising in uh, this last summer with, with with that gang, we had a place in Stonington, Massachusetts, and uh, uh, we had video. People brought their video cameras, you know, every, you know and, and, and people videotape stuff. There was, there was one hilarious scene where uh, uh, Dan Castellaneta was playing a particularly vicious nun who was walking on the back of, uh, of this priest. <laughs> you know, it was very, very funny, but obviously, you know, it's, 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 so yeah, no, we, uh, these days video is so cheap and it's so easy, so uh, sometimes somebody will come up with a piece of blocking or a piece of business right. that, that, that you can use. I mean, you have to do it with people who are willing to make the gift and who expect to get a gift back. Mm -hmm. So I've been kicking around actually maybe renting a house and just doing this with a batch of, uh, batch of people as a, you know, uh, as a, as, as a money-making thing, you know? Mm -hmm. People hire me and we'll do it for a week. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's but there's a there's a way of doing this. This does free you up, and it does uh, it does. Uh, so there, all of this stuff is about improv and how improv is related to playwriting. We've got what like five minutes tops. Yep. Okay, we have five minutes. Anybody want to want to ask anything else uh, about anything that I've uh, that I've uh, I've covered here? Yes. Hi, I'm Joe. Thanks for being here. Um, oh, my pleasure. I have a question. When, have you ever had? Um, a reveal to a negotiation that you knew was in the right place, then you put the show up in front of an audience, and it's too soon, or it's too late, or? I, I guess I'm not could quite understanding a reveal to a negotiation. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm trying not to use the word plot point. Yeah. But like, yeah, I want a loan. Like, when you yeah. finally get to it, Yeah. Do, did, you, did it ever come in the wrong place, and you didn't realize that until you saw it? Audience. Not not with an audience because I'm I, I tend to workshop stuff uh, pretty thoroughly before I allow something to go into rehearsal for a final production. I think these days it's so expensive to put on a final production that if you haven't workshopped something uh, and tested it out, uh, it, it's 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 for me it's irresponsible not to have a script to be in such good shape that uh, by the time I. I go into rehearsal for a final production. People make jokes about it with me, but I rarely change more than half a page when, when I'm in final rehearsal. I just had a show called uh, Court Martial at Fort Devens, and we changed about half a page. I found a way to get to something soon, faster. That's about it. And it was the same half a page, or? No, no, I, I, I'm just saying that on an average, <coughs> I, 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 tend, I, I tend to go through such a, a, a process of testing stuff, because when you're, when you're doing the full production, people are spending big money, they don't want to sit off to the side while you're rewriting something. So I, I, I workshop stuff within an inch of its life before I allow it to, uh, before I allow it to be produced. Mm -hmm. I, I, actors don't want to have to keep learning new lines. 
it drives them nuts. They just want to be able to work. And if they, if you can show them the respect of giving them a text that's going to say substantially the same. But you can test it out. You can use, that's what the workshop system is for. So, but sure, I get things wrong in, in first drafts all the time. That's why they're first, first drafts. Lanford Wilson mm -hmm. uh, used to say, he didn't know who's, who he was quoting, but he said something which I always loved, which was that the first, the first draft is written by the artist, the second by the critic. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I do believe that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, oh yeah. Well, oh, so going back to your say, we can chat with Dan and the group. Yeah. Um, how do you set that up? I and mean, what is the? Everybody's coming expecting to give a gift and get a gift. So yeah. how do you actually organize that? Have you got outlines? Do you just have a premise? Do you Some, have sometimes you people actually that? have outlines for plays, and sometimes people just have an idea for for a scene. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I, I had an idea for a scene about a, uh, about a guy who was marrying into a family that was way wealthier than he was, talking to his father-in-law. And the father-in-law not being shy about letting him know that he was marrying up and that he was going to give him crap about it. And so Dan and a guy named Jonathan Stark, Jonathan came out of the Groundlings and uh, was writer-producer of the world according to Jim for a number of years, but he's a brilliant improviser. They just started improvising, and I used half of what they said in the script, and then I had other ideas and took it in other places. But that's all I needed to say to them. So you just started with that one idea, and that turned into it was tremendous. a play and a full play. Well, it's, it's on its way to being a full play. Yeah. That, and it's, it's, it's married to a, to a half page from an early Faulkner novel that you wouldn't <laughs> identify. Ooh. Flags in the dust. <laughs> I don't think any Faulkner scholar will recognize it. That's what it's marrying those two elements. So anyway, I, I want to I want to thank you. You've got my email address if you have questions. If you if you're interested in doing any of this stuff, either the summer improv retreat or uh, I'm game to uh, I'm game to put uh, to put together a week in uh, in Stonington, Massachusetts. If enough people want to throw in money to rent the house and uh, and hire me to do it, but it's a week. Yeah. How come you don't do it as like um, you know? A once a week thing in the middle of the year, you've got too much it, trouble. You think it has to be yeah, expensive? Yeah, it's very hard. It, it, one, of the, one of the benefits of going away for a week is there's no distraction. The work gets done. That's a good answer. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, and I, I don't know. <laughs>